The Fed 15 podcast is presented by Serving Those Who Serve, a financial planning practice serving federal government employees and retirees all over the country. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be taken as financial advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. The opinions expressed by our hosts are their own and do not reflect the views, policies, or position of either Raymond James or Serving Those Who Serve. Securities are offered through Raymond James Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services are offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors, Inc. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker-dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services, Inc. Welcome, everyone, to the Fed 15 podcast sponsored by Serving Those Who Serve. I, each week, we'll discuss the latest news and info the Feds need to know in 15 minutes ish or less. So whether you're a seasoned Fed or just starting in, out in your career, Fed 15, we got you covered. So grab your coffee, your energy a drink, your green juice, whatever it is that gets you rolling or keeps you rolling. Kick back, spend some time with us, and we will tell you what you need to know but may have missed. We are your host. I am Dan Sype, and I am joined by the energetic and exciting just English. Wow, those are kind adjectives, energetic adjectives. Thanks, Dan. How's it going? I, I, I do my best to be thesaurus rex. <laughs> and you do a good job I, of it. I'm I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, it, it's funny. Chelsea, one of our advisors, mentioned, and I don't know why this would surprise me, but it, it kind of did. And it's like one of our advisors came into our group training meeting. We call that Hive Mind. And he goes, hey, Dan, I meant to let you know, one of the new clients said, hey, Dan looks like he's lost weight. He's looking good. Tell him to keep it up. It's like, that's right. People watch these things. And, and we know you do. We know you do. We're seeing the numbers go up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for noticing. But in, in my case, it, there, there's actually a reason that wasn't, hey, I'm trying to lose weight. I joined the ranks of the plant-based diet folks. My doc kind of advised me that would be a good path for me. And if you've watched this, you know that I am surrounded by brilliant people who are a light year younger than me, one of which is on today. You've met Caitlin a couple of times. So they made me promise I got to take care of myself. And so so I joined those ranks. Now, Chelsea, you have you have been in those ranks for quite some time. Isn't that correct? That's right. Yep. Proud plant-based society member. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's funny because uh, I'm, I'm coming up on year two, going into year three. And I guess I've, I've, I've always been more of a foodie than a carnivore. I made meat dishes because that's how I grew up. So it wasn't like only meat or that type of thing. Sure. Uh, but I can honestly say, I, I don't know what your experience was or, or when you made the, the decision, Chelsea, but for me, that whole first year was, can I do this and not lose my mind? I knew I wasn't going to die. But, you know, can I even do this? And so I didn't really lose any weight because I, I didn't specifically think about what I was doing besides just being plant-based. And unfortunately, within that first year, I discovered something. And that was that Ben and Jerry's has plant-based ice cream. They sure do. And, and you got to read the nutrition, the nutritional information on that because you house one of those every single day. Uh, you're probably not going to lose a lot of weight. So now I've completed year two. So as I ease into year three, I'm kind of started getting excited about learning how to cook with it, you know, and that type of thing. So how about you? Uh, how how did you come to it? And, uh, yeah. and what's your faves? Yeah. So the first time I started dabbling in plant-based food was, gosh, about a decade ago in 20, in 2014. It was more of a like a challenge from a, a classmate uh, at school, and she was eating something, and I didn't recognize what it was. And she told me a little bit about her being vegan, and she said you should try it out. And so we were in a in a group in Spanish class, and me and the other girl in our group, we said, okay, we'll try it for a semester. And luckily, the dining halls at the University of Michigan are very accommodating to all sorts of dietary needs. And so it was pretty easy for me when I wasn't having to cook for myself to have what was available in the dining hall. 
I didn't go fully plant-based until about, I want to say six or seven years ago now, maybe. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely an adjustment at first, but I found that it helped me enjoy cooking. I did not like cooking beforehand, but it forced me to get creative and look for alternative options and see what's out there and try to find ways to put things together. Now, some of our favorite go-tos are like homemade black bean burgers. You can get great ones at the, you know, any grocery store in the freezer section, but we really like making our own, topping them with some of our favorite barbecue sauce from yours truly. Yeah. And yes, uh, I'm a vegan who makes barbecue sauce. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many options out there. The the black bean burgers, we make banh mi bowls with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Vietnamese banh mi sandwiches. But no. we, oh, okay. Highly recommend. But uh, you can find good vegan banh mi sandwiches out there with tofu. And so we just like to turn that into bowl form. And yeah, I mean, all kinds of stews and soups and bowls. And I mean, really all kinds of things out there. I'll just throw out one last thing. Mushroom tacos are probably one of my favorite go-tos as well. Oh, and we're going to, I'm, I'm going to have to, I don't have any recipes to swap back. So I'll just give you more barbecue sauce if you give me some recipes. How's that? I'm happy to share any and all recipes that I like with you. Absolutely. Deal. Deal. Okay. So let's jump in because uh, we've, we've got a couple of, I think, you know, pretty interesting topics. Chelsea, you know, you're going to be telling us about something that most folks just don't know much about, and that's a donor advised fund. And with some of the simplification that came in the tax code, we found people that were, you know, losing charitable deductions, but still had a strong charitable motivation. Donor advised fund can help with that. And mine, I, I got to give props to our our comrade in arms, Caitlin Murray. She bugged me to write this thing because I've been I've been talking about it for years. We've got an article up right now: how feds can get an extra whole year of service credit without working an extra year, and that comes from having a strategy for how they will use their sick and annual leave in consort. And it's a little bit, I'm going to say, it's a little bit radical, even because. One of the things that I've observed is I meet a lot of feds who are not putting any thought into what they do with their use or lose annual leave. So wherever you are in your federal career, you're building up annual leave. And whatever you don't use in a given year can roll over until you reach about 240 hours if you're in a non-SES position. Once you've done that, I just bounce off a lot of people over the almost 40 years I've been doing this. They end up taking the last two weeks of the year off, which is great if you want. If that's your goal to have that amazing time with your family and that type of thing, by all means, do it. But if you're just doing it because, oh, I got use or lose leave, so I'm just going to take it here. I'm going to propose what might be a radical notion, which is to use your use or lose annual leave in lieu of sick leave and let that sick leave accumulate. Why? Because 2,087 hours of sick leave equal one extra year. One extra year for retirement computation, not eligibility, but for computation of the annuity for not working an extra year. So work 30, get a pension for 31, for example. Okay, so how do you do that? I'm going to encourage you in this case to go to the article. I can't possibly cover it because it's it's long. I'll tell you that up front. I'll apologize and then take the apology back. I apologize that it's long, but Caitlin really pushed me to make sure this is a how-to, folks. Okay, download this, keep this, share it with your friends, share it with every new Fed, because I take it out from year one, but I also take it out from wherever you are in federal service. So we call it the enriched leave strategy. That's our name for it. And, you know, in a nutshell, by the time someone has been in federal service 15 years, they've got five weeks of annual leave at least. And if you're at a place, where you're at use or lose, and you take your normal two weeks, that's a whole lot of extra that is either being lost or is being taken without a plan. What I'm suggesting is use that in lieu of sick leave for those doctor's appointments, things like that. And it's now I can hear it already. Keyboard's clacking. You want me to burn vacation while I'm sick? Not burn. I want you to invest it in the process. Because if you take a look, and I'm going to give you some takeaways before I hand things over to Chelsea, 
for what you can do. Number one is make sure you read the article and work through so you can see where you are in the process. Because first couple of years, you're accumulating four hours of annual leave. Next couple of years, you're accumulating six. By the time you're, you're 15, you're accumulating eight for each pay period. So that's a powerful thing to know. The other thing that I put in here is keep in mind that your annual leave grows in value. So whatever you're being paid now, the earlier you save up that usually lose annual leave, you're going to save it at your current pay scale and you're going to sell it at your new pay scale. So you might be $80,000 this year. You might be selling this back at 190000 a year. So that's a great investment for you. But again, you can begin to systematically utilize sick leave accumulating versus annual leave once you've gotten to that 240. So I take you through it. I show you how a brand new Fed can have their 240 saved up and still take two weeks of vacation every in a little over two years. And then they have the ability to start making sure that they use that sick leave or build that sick leave up for later. So literally in a 30-year career, a person can save up a year and a half of service through sick leave. And I'm not suggesting it's realistic to never take sick leave. I'm not doing that. But there are still strategic ways that you can maximize it. So as you go through the article, be sure to read that stuff. We already have some questions coming in. I'm happy to answer them for you. I want to make sure that this is a real time strategy that you can use. So as far as action steps, what you do today, check your current sick leave total on your leave and earning statement. Subtract that number from 2087. Okay. That's going to show you how much you need to build up to that one extra year, that free year. <laughs> okay. For working the same number of years, then divide that by the remaining number of years of retirement determine what your use lose leave is every year. And then that way you'll be able to calculate how many years it'll take you to get to that 2087 and then do it. Then do it. Now, a couple of notes. I know I was a lot healthier when I was younger. Okay. So I'm thinking that's when I didn't use most of my sick leave. So you can pile it up in the early years. And yes, it's a fact of life that serious health conditions pop up. And we don't want that to happen for everybody anybody, but we know they do. That will disrupt it. Having a lot of sick leave stored, not a bad position to be in. So, so aim for making your federal career even more rewarding by intentionally managing the two leaves. Read that article, read that article, share it, share it, share it, share this podcast as well. Promise me I'm deputizing all of our folks to do that. So Chelsea, Tell us about donor advised funds and what people might be able to do for getting some tax advantages there. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, dive right in. So investing in stocks is all about watching your money grow, right? But what do you do when those gains start working against you? Significant appreciation there can lead to significant taxes. And that can oh, be- Oh, yeah. Real- Ouch. <laughs> I know we forget about that sometimes, right? And that can be a real challenge for investors. So today I'm going to go into how to sidestep some of those hefty capital gains taxes and make the most of your appreciated stock all well, also making a positive impact. So that's where the donor advised fund comes in. So what is a donor advised fund exactly? Think of it as an investment account specifically for charitable giving. You contribute assets like appreciated stock to the donor advice fund, and then you get to advise on how those funds are distributed to your favorite 501c3 charities. The beauty of the setup is that any unspent funds in the donor advice fund can continue to grow over time, potentially increasing the amount of money that goes to charity. And a key point here, you can contribute to your donor advice fund whenever it makes sense for you. Now, one of the main benefits of using a donor advised fund is the ability to avoid paying capital gains taxes on appreciated stock. So here's an example. 
Dan, suppose that you have stock worth $15,000 that you originally bought for $5,000. If you sold that stock, you'd be looking at $10,000 in capital gains, which could mean around $1,500 in taxes. But if you donate that stock directly to a donor advice fund, you avoid those taxes entirely. Now, the full $15,000 goes into the donor advice fund, and if you itemize your deductions, you can deduct that $15,000 from your taxable income. It's a win-win. More money for the charity and a lower tax bill for you. But the tax benefits don't stop there. Lowering your taxable income through donor advice fund contributions can also make Roth IRA conversions more attractive. So by converting funds from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, when you're in a lower tax bracket, you benefit from tax-free growth and no required minimum distributions. So with our historically low tax rates that we have right now, with those set to expire after December 31st, 2025, strategic tax planning is really important right now. So there's some more details about a bunching contribution strategy. I'm not going to get into all of that today, just in the interest of time, but really great in the article, worth checking out. But main point here, if your itemized deductions fall below certain amounts, you won't see the tax benefits from a donor advice fund. And that's where the bunching contribution strategy comes in. So you want to look at spreading out the donations over several years. Um, excuse me, instead of spreading them out over several years, you want to bunch them into one year to go over that uh, standard deduction amount. So Smart. wrap it up real quick. Some, If you're thinking about setting up a donor advice fund, here are a few things you want to keep in mind. First, do your homework on the sponsor. Make sure they accept appreciated stock, see what their fees are like, and find out how they handle and fund the investment options. Next, be picky about which stocks you donate. You want to focus on those that have gone up the most to get the biggest benefit and steer clear of donating stocks that have lost value because you can use those losses to offset gains in the future and lower your taxes. But lastly, the paperwork. Of course, there's always paperwork involved, right? Uh, You'll need to use IRS Form 8283 if you're donating more than $500 worth of non-cash assets. And be sure to follow whatever forms that your donor advice fund sponsor requires. So to wrap things up, donating appreciated stock to a donor advice fund is a really smart way to cut down on your taxes and boost your charitable giving at the same time. It's a win-win for you and the causes you care about. I know donor advice funds can feel complicated. If you need some help figuring out how to make the most of your charitable contributions or any other financial questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Serving Those Who Serve. Just shoot us an email at askstws at stwserve.com. We're here to help. Absolutely. Uh, great stuff, Chelsea. You know, and there's folks, there's so much for this. And and I'll drop a little lure in the water. If this piqued your curiosity, definitely hit us up at Ask SWS because there's another layer to it where you can actually raise your net worth by doing this. Can't wait to show you. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, That's all the time we have today. But folks, we will see you next time and we will be back next week with the latest updates that you need to make informed decisions about your career and financial well-being as a Fed. Yes, and be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel, Fed Life, so that you never miss an episode. And please, please, please remember to share it with your friends and colleagues. And for more information about all these topics and more, Check out the blog. That's blog com. Subscribe to our newsletter, the weekly serving. We'll ship it to you. You don't even have to go looking. That'll come to you every single week. And for those who want to dive even deeper into learning about your federal benefits and financial planning for feds, we encourage you to join us for one of our complimentary webinars. Uh, we've got our social security webinar coming up on September 12th from 1 to 4 p.m., and our very popular FEHB webinar coming up on September 18th from 10.30 to 2.30. Dan and Ed will cover FEHB, Medicare, and TRICARE. That's a big one you don't want to miss. Or if you prefer a one-on-one approach, feel free to reach out to our team directly for a financial planning consultation at askstwserve at stwserve.com. Absolutely. So folks, 
went a little bit over. This was one of those ish episodes, but I, I think you'll find it was worthwhile. Thanks for listening to uh, the Fed 15. I'm Dan Seip. I'm Chelsea English. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>